it's not the Mandela effect, they just don't know scripture. Hey fam, it's Rachel. Today on Crack Your Bible, I want to share with you a very small portion of my trip to Europe, specifically my very first night in Rome, because I saw paganism everywhere in Rome. And not because of the ancients, but it was care of the Catholic Church. And there's a specific reason for that. It's because people were not able to crack their Bible. And yesterday was the 501st anniversary of the Reformation. And we need to be thanking God and utilizing the freedom that we have thanks to the Reformation to crack our Bibles. Now, before we get started, make sure you hit subscribe with the bell with a parenthesis so you're notified of a new gospel message. Because of course, Satan and YouTube and Google, they're one and the same, but they do not want you to know the gospel and they will never notify you of a new gospel message unless you hit subscribe with about with the parentheses so let's get started so like I said it's 2018 and yesterday was the 501st anniversary of the Reformation where Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of a German church outlining where Catholicism was not lining up with scripture and how things needed to change. Now, this was a huge deal and everybody, regardless of whether, whether you're a Protestant or a Catholic, needs to be thankful for the fact that we live in a post-Reformation world. Because prior to that time, people did not have the ability to read the Bible in their own language. It was in Latin and it was in Greek. And not everybody spoke those languages. It was only a select few at the top and they were the ones who read and interpreted the Bible and then all the masses just had to listen to it because they had no other option. And this is so obvious in Rome. The very first night after we checked into the hotel, my sister and I decided to do a really quick walk around the block just to see what was open, just to see like, where are we in relation to all the cool tourist stuff? And we stumbled upon this giant fountain called the Fontana del Aqua Feliz. Now, this is a fountain that is not just decorative, it has statues in it, but it's also for drinking. And as an American who lives in Las Vegas, you cannot drink out of the fountains in the United States. Like if they have statues in them, if they're in a park, those are not for drinking. Like they are very unsafe. They have un they have like reclaimed water. So like street runoff in them. Uh, you'll see like hobos going to the bathroom in them. You'll see like all sorts of gross stuff. So never drink the water in a fountain in the United States. But in Europe, everybody's like filling up their water bottles because these fountains, while very decorative, were for drinking purposes. It was to bring fresh water into different areas of the city. So as an American, I'm like, oh, that's so disgusting. But they also had different scenes that were depicted. So like the Trevi Fountain, you have like mythological creatures. But at this fountain, it's also known as the Fountain of Moses. And that's because on one side you have Aaron, the other side you have Joshua. And in the middle, you have this giant statue of Moses. But Moses doesn't look like a biblical figure because he has horns coming out of his head. And this is why Christians, I want you to crack your Bibles because we see that when this was built, this was clearly built by somebody who did not know their scripture. And I see this all the time, especially on YouTube now. You'll see people say like, oh, it's the Mandela effect that Moses has horns. Every time Moses is depicted, he has horns. Okay, well, first of all, Moses has not always been depicted with horns. That was about, there's a 600 year window where Moses was depicted with horns on his head. And it was thousands of years after Moses ever existed thousands of miles away from wherever Moses actually lived. So this is not like a snapshot that's like, wow, Moses actually had horns. Moses did not have horns. And if people had the ability to read the Bible, or if they did have a Bible in their own language, or they understood the Bible in the Latin or the Greek, then they would know Moses does not have horns. It's not the Mandela effect. They just don't know scripture. Because in the 300, so this is 300 years after Jesus walked the earth, there was a man named Jerome and he created the Latin Vulgate Bible. So he translated the Bible from Hebrew and Greek into Latin. And this is 
the Latin Vulgate Bible, which the Catholic Church used as their official Bible in like the 16th century. In the Bible that Jerome translated in Exodus 34, he made a small mistake. And what he wrote was that when Moses had his audience with God on Mount Sinai, where he received the Ten Commandments, it says that his face shone. And you know, his face was like lit up because he had been in the presence of God. Well, the word for horns and the word for like shining is querin, but in Hebrew, there are no vowels. So you just have like the three letters. You have to just instinctively know based off of the context, which word it's going to be. And Jerome put in that Moses had horns coming out of his skin instead of his skin was shining with like the radiance of God's glory. So this is where, thanks to the Catholic Church, that everybody started writing down that Moses had horns. Now this is a huge problem because anybody who has actually read scripture would know that we can just continue reading the scripture that Moses had to put a veil over his face because people were afraid of him because whenever he was in the presence of God speaking to him, God's glory would be on him and his face would be so bright, it would scare people. So to cover that brightness, he would put on a veil. If you put on a veil, that's kind of pointless if you have horns because it's still going to stick out, right? We know that these people who created these statues didn't have access or didn't understand scripture in their own language because the Moses having horns idea, they would be able to just point to 2 Corinthians 3 where Paul talks about Moses and the ministry of death versus the ministry of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 3 talks about what our mission is and Paul, because he wasn't one of the apostles, one of the 12, he is telling the other people in churches at the Church of Corinth, like, hey, I don't need a letter of recommendation. Like, we are all ministers of Christ, and you can see from my works that what I'm saying is true because you are coming to Christ. You guys are bearing the fruit. So this shows that what I'm saying is true. So in 2 Corinthians 3, it says, are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation written on our hearts to be known and read by all. Not read by some, read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ towards God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now, here's where he talks about Moses in all of his glory. This completely debunks the horns idea. Now, if the ministry of death, this is the law, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all. Talking about the law. Because of the glory that surpasses it, that is Jesus. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory." Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end because his face would fade in and out because he did not have the Holy Spirit living inside of him. If he was out of God's presence, that glory would start to fade away. Then he'd have to go back up then he'd be in glory a little bit longer. So not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end, 
but their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is Spirit. All over Europe, I'm not just talking about Italy, I'm talking about when I was in Athens, I'm talking about when I was in London, I saw paganism everywhere. And I also saw churches everywhere. I saw it co-mingled. And I saw people who think that their righteousness comes from their works and how they can pray on the ground. I saw people that were just laying on the ground prostrate. They were not homeless people. These people were religious beggars where they thought that their righteousness came from how pious they were and how they took vows of poverty. And this is not what God wants. God has made a way for us where we have the opportunity to read the gospel for ourselves. Martin Luther, when he was 21 years old, was struck by lightning and he prayed to a saint, which we know we cannot do. We don't pray to the dead because there is one mediator between man and God, the man Jesus Christ. But Martin Luther, in his ignorance, while he was still in school, he was, he was going to be a lawyer, he prayed to St. Anne saying, if I survive this, I will become a monk. Martin Luther, because he was well-read, because he was a learned person, he was able to read the scriptures for himself, unlike all the other people, all the other lay people. They didn't have the opportunity to read the gospel for themselves. And as he read it, he saw what the Catholic Church was doing did not line up to scripture. And that's what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to search the scripture. We are supposed to be Bereans. And we're supposed to test every spirit to make sure that it's from God. We're to show ourselves approved. This isn't something that we just talk about. It's something that we do. We're not just hearers of the word. We're doers of the word. And we can't be doers of the word if we don't know what the word says. So Martin Luther, as he's reading the scriptures, he's saying, well, what the Catholic Church is doing does not line up with scripture. Now, everybody at that time, because the Reformation hadn't happened, was a Catholic. They didn't really have a choice in Europe because they, they couldn't read the scripture because it was in a language that they didn't speak. So Martin Luther, he goes to the door of his German church in October 31st, 1517, and he nails 95 theses or grievances, errors of the Catholic Church that he's saying, hey, this does not line up with scripture. And one of his big issues was the fact that indulgences were being sold to the poor. Now, an indulgence was, hey, hey you can buy yourself out of uh, limbo, which doesn't even exist in scripture. It was like a a place between heaven and hell called purgatory. And for a half a year's wage, you could get a piece of paper from the Catholic Church saying, hey, your sins are forgiven. Now you won't go to purgatory or you've bought your, your deceased loved one out of purgatory. These are the same people that Jesus talked about. They eat up widows' houses. They tie up heavy burdens on people but they don't even lift a finger to help anybody. These people are all about the law. God warned us over and over and over about the people who are obsessed with the flesh. They deny people from marrying. They say, do not touch, do not eat, do not taste. They talk about angels and visions. It's these same Gnostics that have infiltrated the church and they created the Catholic Church. And what do they do? They just scammed people. And Martin Luther is like, hey, we need to get back on track. And not only was the indulgence thing an issue, he wanted the common person to be able to read the gospel for themselves because he said, we're all priests unto our God, which is scripturally accurate. And the Catholic Church didn't like that. 
because they want to be the ones in charge because, hey, nobody can argue with you if they don't know what the scripture says. And then you can abuse people all you want if people don't know the truth. But this is why when we turn to the Lord, when we see what God has said, and we understand who he is as we delve deeper into the word and we meditate on it day and night. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And that is what has happened thanks to the Reformation. We now have freedom to know God. The Bible has been put into languages that we understand so that we can get to know God on a personal level. We don't have to go through bishops or the Pope. We don't have to go through friars. We don't have to go through monks. We can read it for ourselves. And I want everybody out there to recognize how lucky they are because it's only been 501 years since this whole debacle took place and it completely transformed the world. And I want you to utilize that freedom to know Jesus. Don't waste the freedom that you have and continue to rely on other people for scripture. You can read the Bible for yourself. This is why I want people to crack their Bible. That is why I didn't say, hey, listen to me. It's called crack your Bible. You crack your Bible. You open it up. You read it. Don't just rely on me. Don't just rely on other YouTube pastors. Don't just rely on the person that you go to their services on Sunday. Read it for yourself because we are going to be kings and priests unto our God. And if you want to know what your purpose in life is, read the Bible because that's where it's spelled out. How are you going to get to know the creator of the universe? First, you need to read the Bible and then you develop your relationship because that's when the Holy Spirit is going to show you things in the scripture. And that's where you're going to start hearing from God. It's when you start reading his word. Because remember, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. This is the word of God. We need to know this. And we have been blessed by living in a time where, you know, it, it's a crazy time, but we have the ability to search the scriptures for free. We can read the Bible for free. You're accessing this video for free. And I don't want you to take that for granted. And I don't want you to fall into the trap that, you know, I see happening. It's like, once we get freedom, there's always going to be these people that want to claw you back under the law. They want to keep you from knowing the gospel. This is why you have the Judaizers. They want you to, oh, we're only going to have services in Hebrew, even though, you know, most of the congregation doesn't speak Hebrew. Or you have the the super Roman Catholics. Oh, we're going to do all of our services in Latin, even though nobody speaks Latin. Or then you have like the KJV onlyists who erroneously claim that this KJV Bible which was based off of corrupted Masoretic texts. I've already talked about it here, which you guys can click on. They'll say, oh, we have to only read the KJV Bible. That's the that's God's preserved word. Nonsense. That's absolute garbage. It's no different than the kind of uh, tyranny that we saw happening in the Catholic Church that kept people stupid. It kept people from a relationship with God because we don't speak the same English that was spoken in King James day. And not only that, English has changed, so words don't even mean the same. So then when you read these old words, you apply today's meaning to those words, even though it means something completely different. For example, the word awful used to mean full of awe. Now it means something really bad. Those have completely opposite definitions. So if you go in there and you read these things and you have the wrong definition because you don't speak the language of the Bible that you're reading, you're not going to understand it. How are you going to get to know God if you don't understand his word? This is why I am so against KJV only nonsense. Not only because it comes from corrupted texts and you have words like unicorns in there, and you also have King James, who didn't want an uprising of people. So he took out the word ecclesia, which is, hey, we are all members of a, a 
a government. We are here for God's government. He didn't want people to be emboldened. He didn't want people to have that freedom. He wanted to keep people down. So he renamed it the church, the pagan word church, instead of ecclesia. He took those truths out of the Bible. But we now have the freedom to go look at the Latin Vulgate. We can have the you know, the Septuagint. We can go look at the Hebrew scriptures. We can look at all the various versions of the Bible and compare and contrast. We can go look through scripture so we're not making obvious stupid mistakes by putting horns on Moses because we don't know what the scriptures say. We don't know what 2 Corinthians 3 says. We're not familiar with Matthew 17 where Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses and Elijah and his face shone like the sun, showing it's not about horns. It's about shining glory and your face lit up. You know, we need to be thankful that we have the opportunity to read the scripture for ourselves because we don't want to wander around in legalism. We don't want to wander around in foolishness. We don't want to make monuments to our own ignorance. And Christians, I just want to embolden you. Go out and read scripture. You are somebody who is going to be a priest unto our God. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to be somebody who speaks multiple languages. God wants you to read your Bible, and that is why he's made it available in your language. He meets you where you are. So don't feel like, hey, I need to learn Hebrew. Hey, I need to learn Greek. Hey, I need to learn Latin. Oh, now I need to learn, you know, early to middle English. No, go pick out a book. I, I don't even care if it's the NIV 1982. Great. That's that's where I learned the Bible. That's the Bible that I learned all of my stuff from. And of course, you guys know I use the ESV, the ISV, the, the KJV, the NKJV. You go out and you look at it and then you go look at concordances. You can go look at the Greek if you want to. And you can, if you really want to study it, you can do those things. But to just have a, a general understanding your basic NIV is fine. Your basic NASB is fine. Your basic K or your NKJV, your basic ESV, they're fine. I want you to go out and read the Bible that you understand because God wants to have a relationship with you. And that is why he made a way for the Bible to come to you. And thank God he did it through somebody like Martin Luther. And, you know, I just wanted to encourage you and just know that um, we are so blessed to live in a time where we have access to Bibles, not only so many Bibles, but we can do it for free. So anyway, that's what I wanted to share with you. I hope you will like, subscribe, and share, and I will talk to you later. Bye.